Good morning everybody. Uh, we have this usual problem where the microphone never works because it's too low. So if you can't hear me, if you want to turn it up that way, or I'll bend down and spread like a giraffe again. Is that better? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you and welcome and thank you for the invitation. As Steve said, we've had Mark from downtown Carmanos Way. Steve is from Ford and if you go further up the lodge, you end up at Beaumont. So, um, I work in the Radiation Oncology Department at Beaumont. I'm going to talk about tumor vasculature. Uh, we've just heard in the first two talks uh, the importance of tumor hypoxia, and tumors become hypoxic if they lack good tumor vasculature. So I've taken examples from the literature to try and explain how tumors and tumor vasculature is affected by different doses of radiation, and I've tried to keep it introductory as best I can, but it might get a bit heavy towards the end. So I have no conflicts of interest to report either. We're a good bunch, the biologists. We have no conflicts at all. So the objectives are to learn how radiation impacts tumor vasculature with respect to radiation dose, too great per fraction or hyperfractionated. Understand the role of tumor hypoxia after a radiation, because if you damage vasculature, you induce hypoxia, and that affects tumor response as we've just seen quite eloquently in the first two talks, and then learn about the mechanism of bone marrow progenitor cell recruitment after radiation in response to hypoxia and how this drives tumor recurrence, specifically in a model of GBM. And that's where it gets a little bit acronym heavy. So this is what I'm going to try and talk about. I'm going to define from my radiobiological perspective conventional hyperfractionation or SRS treatments. I'm going to refresh your memory about the four R's of radiation biology, because we are on an educational course, and then present some experimental animal model data looking at vascular damage after predominantly single doses, and then also some fractionated treatments. And these dose levels were chosen because they're clinically relevant in the animal model, but also pragmatically, it's very difficult to irradiate animals with repeated large doses and maintain good measurements of hypoxia and vascular uh, vascular flow. And then finally, I finish up looking at the mechanisms of tumor recurrence and how this is affected by hypoxia and how this may be influenced after high dose fractions. So I'm saying conventional radiation therapy, as we heard earlier, is about 2 gray. And Mike had 1 to 2 gray. I've got 1.8 to 2 gray. As a radiobiologist, I say anything above 2.5 is hyperfractionated or anything above well, 3 gray, and stereotactic, or SBRT. I've got anything that's greater than one fraction, up to five to eight fractions, with a dose size bigger than conventional. And of course, SRS is the entire dose given in a single fraction, which is really an extreme example of SBRT. So my definitions all run through this category. Now, to remind you all, I'm sure you're all aware, but for those that may need a refresher if we look at the four R's of radiobiology, and I've added a fifth from courtesy of Gordon Steele and Trevor McMillan and John Peacock. So the first one we've got is redistribution or reassortment. So in your interfraction interval of your conventional two group per fraction, you get a radiation dose, you get cell killing, and in that interfraction interval, you get a redistribution of cells in that tumor into more radiosensitive phases of the cell cycle, and then with your second dose, you're targeting those once resistant, now sensitive phases of the cell cycle. So it's progression or reassortment through the cell cycle phases, and that sensitizes your tumor. Second are reoxygenation, and we're going to explore this in much more detail when we talk about vascular effects and hypoxia. And again, it's the same principle. Your first dose kills off the radiation-sensitive cells that are well oxygenated, leaving the radiation-resistant cells in a more hypoxic environment. In that interval, you get reoxygenation, oxygen diffusion. Those hypoxic cells then become reoxygenated and therefore are more sensitive to the second fraction. And with your full course treatment, then you get good reoxygenation, good cell killing. So that's the benefit of the interval in your conventional fractionation scheme. The final two R's, repopulation and repair, work to spare normal tissue effects. So they allow repopulation and repair of damage in the normal tissue, but working for your therapeutic ratio. So they're your four R's of radiobiology, and we're going to focus 
predominantly on reoxygenation because that's the important role for tumor hypoxia and the vascular effects that I'm talking about today. And finally, we've been remiss of me not to mention radiosensitivity. We had that very nice talk from Mike describing radiosensitivity with the LQ model. So that's as far as I'm going to mention that today. And these five R's of radiobiology are well described in this nice article from Gordon Steele and his colleagues. So the, the four or five R's of radiobiology were defined from cell culture experiments and tumor experiments, measuring parameters following radiation treatment, very functional assays. A more recent review from Kevin Hartington and colleagues looking at from clinical oncology in 2007 and then updated more recently in 2013, tried to relate these functional measures, these four R's that we use measure from experimental in cells and in animals with a more molecular biology approach to tumor response. And you can see that the different uh, R's for the repopulation redistribution relate to specific molecular pathways. And you can see here for reoxygenation, which we're talking about in terms of vascular effects and hypoxia, angiogenesis is the most important molecular parameter they mark. But also, if you follow the line up here, we see some self-sufficiency and growth factors. So not only do you get angiogenesis, you get cytokines that drive growth, and this is forming new blood vessels through neovascularization. So it's self-sufficiency of the tumor re recruiting new vessels to allow growth with a hypoxic signal. And you can see that here. I've taken this cartoon from a, a review article, again, a vascular review article, to demonstrate what I'm talking about. Here we can see angiogenesis and we can see the formation of new vessels sprouting from an old blood vessel and that's been attracted to an area of hypoxia so this is the formation of vessels from vessels so this is angiogenesis or we get the formation of new vessels a neovascular genesis which requires the recruitment of cells circulating in the bloodstream generated from stem cells in the hemopoietic system and these form new vessels and again, this occurs in response to cytokines driven by hypoxic signaling. And we'll talk about these angiogenesis and vascular genesis processes as I go through the talk. But clearly you can see in this cartoon, we're getting hypoxia as a key producing cytokines that are driving this process. And of course the hypoxia is driven by vascular damage caused by radiation exposure. So in terms of the four R's and the radiobiology of hyperfractionation, reoxygenation is most likely the most significant radiobiological parameter for SBRT when you're comparing with conventional RT with respect to tumor response. And that's assuming, of course, that your tumor is hypoxic in the first place. And there's considerable evidence, and we've seen it already today, that your tumor is hypoxic. And also it depends on the fact that you have to have fractions for that reoxygenation to occur. If you've got a single SRS fraction, then you've got no interfraction interval because you've got one fraction. So reoxygenation is important. And to remind you, again, a classic cartoon. I think this one's taken from one of Julie Denekamp's reviews, I believe, looking at the principle of reoxygenation as a cartoon to orientate you for the talk. Here we can see that tumors contain a mix of air mixed population of aerated and hypoxic cells, and that's indicated here. It's your hypoxic cells surrounded by aerated cells and well oxygenated. And an X-ray dose will kill cells, preferentially based on their oxygen environment. This radiation kills more oxygenated cells than hypoxic cells, and that's where we define this OER parameter, the oxygen enhancement ratio. And so effectively, you're killing off the aerated cells, and in that interfraction interval, the oxygen diffuses into the hypoxic regions, reoxygenates, and therefore you get a, a new population of aerated cells, which are then subsequently killed in the second dose, and so on, and so on, as you kill the oxygenated cells to address the hypoxic fraction. So fractionation tends to overcome hypoxia in conventional treatments. But what happens in hyperfractionated treatments, SBRT? I won't go into too much detail because Mike's shown this quite nicely. David Carson's publication shows if you compare a full course, two gray treatment, multiple fractions against a single dose of 18 gray for head and neck or 24 gray for prostate, you effectively lose three logs of cell kill. However, this log, three logs of cell kill can be overcome if you give hypoxic boosting treatments. And Mike talked about that in his, in his earlier talk. 
Martin Brown and his group, and I won't disagree with Martin Brown, maybe as vehemently as Mike disagreed with Martin Brown, um, that demonstrated that the expected level of cell killing for radiation-mediated killing is different for different uh, SBRT route regimens, and this is an article that Mike showed down here at the bottom, this 2010 publication, and he demonstrated from modeling calculations and compared this with uh, non-small cell lung cancer studies in Stanford, their clinical outcomes, that there was a, a divergence in the modeling to the clinical outcomes, and suggested that tumor size in their clinical data was very significant, and as uh, tumor size was significant, they related tumor size to the amount of tumor hypoxia. So this modeling association with clinical data indicated tumor hypoxia as an important factor following SBRT. And we've just seen you get good clinical outcomes with non-small cell lung cancer from SBRT, and if there's some undercalculation and some miscalculation here, then maybe there are other factors in addition to the direct cell killing, and as Steve's just alluded to, these are immune responses and vascular damage. So we'll talk about vascular damage in a little more detail. So we've already seen this figure. I've taken this from the original article in radiology. This is a uh, rat model, subcutaneous tumor grown on the flank of a rat, irradiated with a single dose of 10 gray. That tumor is then harvested, plated, and clonogenic assay is measured on a single cell suspension in an ex vivo type clonogenic assay. Here's clonogenic fraction. Here's days after harvesting that tumor to do the assessment. And you can see there's a decrease in survival with time post-treatment. And this is suggested by the authors to reflect vascular mediated killing effects and then you see a, start, a small increase here at day three and maybe this is to do with proliferation this rapidly proliferating mouse uh, rat tumor so rat tumor so the authors conclude that they attribute this decrease in viability of the tumor cells after two days to the indirect killing effect so you're not targeting cells but to vascular mediated damage so this was the original publication in this rather unusual rat model They've followed up very recently with this article that's just appeared in this month's edition of the Red Journal from the same group using the different model. Again, it's a mouse tumor in a C3H mouse. Again, as Steve alluded to, large tumors, six to seven millimeters in diameter, so a good hypoxic fraction. And it's the same assay. They irradiate the tumor in the flank, they harvest the tumor, they isolate single cells, clean the single cells, plate them, and measure clonogenicity. But the difference between this recent study and that earlier study in the rat is they measured survival at different dose levels. So I hope you can see this. This is at 10 gray. So it's the same experiment at 10 gray. And there seems to be no effect of delayed plating after 10 gray. Then after 15 gray, and we see a similar reproduction as we saw in the rat study, a decrease followed by an increase. At 20 gray, a much bigger decrease. And at 30 gray single dose, a much larger decrease. So they've done a dose response to measure the vascular effects after a large SRR, SRR, a large single dose, looking at dose response. So you can see after 10, 15, 20, and 30 gray, there's a different effect, and there's a dose response evident here. They indicate that this increase in cell killing is probably due to proliferation following treatment. So in that same publication, they've put that dose data together in a single panel for clonogenic survival. Here's surviving fraction. Here's the total dose as a single SRS dose for cells plated at day zero and cells plated at day five. And you can clearly see some displacement of the curve indicating increased sensitivity when you allow those cells to exist in the tumor and you're getting a vascular mediated hypoxia driven cell killing event. And it's quite marked in this particular model. They quantified this response in this article by looking at the animals that were given 20 gray after two days. And we've seen a similar panel here. Mike showed one from Bert van der Kogel. This is from the group with Rob Griffin and Song. You can see here the blood vessels here are stained in red. This is CD31, a marker for endothelial cells. Blood perfusion with Herxt is in blue, so if a blood vessel is open, you inject Herxt, the Herxt goes through the blood vessel, leaches out of the blood vessel, diffuses out, and can be detected by fluorescent microscopy. And in this panel, hypoxia is green. So in their control tumors, there is some hypoxia in areas of low vascular density, but in areas of high vascular density, you see good levels of perfusion indicated by the blue Herxt staining. But when you irradiate with 
a single dose of 20 gray, an assay two days later, you see smaller concentrations of vessels, a lower vascular density. You still see areas of hypoxia, but you lose areas of perfusion. So the vessels are surviving the 20 gray, or some vessels are surviving the 20 gray, but you're losing vascular function. There's no perfusion. So we're not actually necessarily killing all of the vessels, but we're preventing vascular flow in that tumor. And if they quantified these images, in this panel on the right, this is percent positive area of fluorescence for the control versus the 20 gray after 48 hours. There's very little difference in the untreated tumor for, uh, versus the 20 gray at 48 hours for pimonidazole staining, the level of hypoxia in other words, but there's a large significant difference in vascular flow. So what they're showing in this experiment is this large single dose is restricting the flow of blood through the tumor, but not necessarily killing all of the blood vessels in the tumor. So this paper was just recently released this past month. And they quantified that response of vascular flow, and I appreciate this might be difficult to see, but this is taken straight out of the article. They looked at measures of hypoxia, either CA9 or HIF1, two, compact, two um, proteins that are involved in hypoxic signaling, and they showed with time, across the bottom here, against percent staining, with time you see an increase in hypoxic staining for HIF1, an increase in hypoxic staining for CA9, indicating hypoxia is being induced in these tumors, and also an increase in VGF, indicating that there's going to be a vascular event occurring in this tumor after treatment. But the vessels remained fairly similar. The number of vessels, CD130, CD31 stained vessels, remained similar in this study. So from this single-dose study in a muron model, muron tumor in a muron model, a rapidly proliferating tumor, we can see that cell death determined at two to five days after 10 gray was very similar to immediately after radiation. So maybe after 10 gray in this tumor, we're not seeing any effect. But once your dose size increases above 10 gray to 15 and 20 gray, you're seeing large, significant dose-dependent responses. So the larger your dose in your SRS radiations, the more damage, vascular damage and vascular occlusions are gonna happen in that tumor. So in this study, in this tumor model, they showed little vascular effects at doses less than 10 gray, but large effects at doses higher than 10 gray. And the tumor blood vessels were severely occluded for two days after 20 gray. And they demonstrated that the occlusion of the tumor blood vessels, even though the blood vessels were still present or the endothelial cells were still staining, you saw an increase in hypoxic signaling. And if you've got an increase in hypoxic signaling, then that will recruit these endothelial cells or these EPCs or the bone marrow derived progenitor cells from the bone, from circulating system towards that tumor to drive neovascularization as we saw in that earlier slide because the hypoxic signaling in the HIF and the SDF1 as we'll get to later recruit those uh, bone marrow derived progenitor cells. In an earlier paper switching back to this rat model they compared the effect of a large single dose in the open triangle here, which is this lower line here, versus five gray times four or 2.5 gray times eight for vascular volume using a radioisotope and, ev uh, sorry, evasion of plasma protein using a radioisotope and vascular volume with histology for this large single dose compared with fractionated treatments, even using a large dose of five gray times four. And you can see that large single dose has a much more marked effect and a reduction in vascular volume, as well as a greater release of plasma from the damaged blood vessels. So these large single doses are clearly having more of a dramatic effect than even five gray times four or a standard conventional 2.5 times eight. Moving from and worked from another group, because all this mouse work and rat group work I've just presented was from the same group. This is David Chen's group, a recent publication in 2009, using a similar approach. What they did, they took a muron prostate tumor in a C57 black 6 mouse, established subcutaneous tumors, and irradiated with either a large single dose, 25 gray, or 4 gray per fraction times 5 days per week for 3 weeks. So 3 weeks of treatment one treatment per day. And they measured similar parameters that we've seen in that earlier work from Song's group. Here we've got percentage of hypoxia against days after radiation 
therapy. And it's the same approach here with the vascular staining and the perfusion in blue, the hypoxia in green, the vessels in red. And you can see for control, there's some nice vessels present, areas of hypoxia and good levels of perfusion in blue. But after a large single dose, or the fractionated schedule, you can see some differences compared to controls. And what they do is they quantify this data with, a, with a, a fluorescent staining, percentage of hypoxia based on the fluorescence intensity. After day one, there's very little difference. And after five to seven days or 12 to 14 days in this rapidly proliferating mouse tumor, you can see an increase in tumor size, reflective an increase in hypoxia. But when you irradiate with a large single dose, you see a decrease, but then that suddenly increase in hypoxia but you don't you see a decrease after multiple fractions but you don't see that subsequent increase a few weeks after treatment and the rationale for not seeing that increase is you are still seeing reoxygenation in this multifraction regimen so four gray five days a week for three weeks you're seeing reoxygenation and therefore you're getting lower levels of hypoxia three weeks after treatment in comparison to a large single dose of 25 gray. So if you are irradiating with these very large hyperfractionated doses, you are inducing hypoxia, and that hypoxia is remaining within that tumor for a long time after treatment. So this is work from David Chen's group. So if we look at the, trying to get some conclusions from the indirect effects or the vascular effects after hyperfractionated versus standard conventional RT, if we look at all the data together, and I've, throughout this talk I've been putting some of the, present, the re references down at the bottom of the slide, we see vascular damage is less significant after a 3 to 8 grade per fraction, or even comparison to 2 grade per fraction. So after 2.5 grade, you get a decrease in blood flow, but it returns quite, rap quite quickly and quite rapidly. 5 to 10 grade, you get a decrease in blood flow, returns to 2 to 3 days. But once you get above 10 grade, or 15 to 20 grade, you see rapid decreases in blood flow, and it lasts for many days. So if you are radiating with three fractions of 18 gray, for example, and you've got a, less than a week between each fraction, you're gonna get some radiation-induced hypoxia for that second treatment. So you can see the higher the dose, the larger and more rapid the decrease, and the longer that prevails. So with large fraction SRS, reoxygenation re between fractions, you need fractions for reoxygenation to occur. So after a single treatment, it's less of a concern. But you are seeing a lot of heterogeneous vascular damage above 10 gray. And various studies have shown this, and this study I will allude to here. This is a study where we're looking at large single doses of endothelial cell apoptosis in tumors. And I've shown examples of studies that show vascular decreases, but there are others in the literature, if you look, earlier studies showing a decrease in vascular function for 24 hours, lasting seven days after large single doses. So that's what happens in a urine tumor grown subcutaneously on the flank of an animal. What happens if we use a um, human tumor grown in a mouse and grown orthotopically in the site of origin? And the site I'm going to ex show examples are a GBM. And I've got here the survival trends for clinical GBM. Surgery alone is very poor. If you add radiation, you get an improvement. If you add chemotherapy, you get a further improvement. And if you add telozolomide for the standard of care, this is the STUP protocol, you see a significant improvement. But the data shows that most GBMs relapse within the irradiated volume. And that's despite putting sufficient dose in to cause sufficient tumor cell kill to eradicate all the clonages in that tumor. We do see some recurrence within the tr treatment field. And several studies have demonstrated that this re recurrence within the treatment field for GBM is vascular mediated. This is work from Martin Brown's group, and it's a lovely publication. If you fancy a read one Sunday afternoon, they took an orthotopic mouse model, they implanted the tumor in the brain. The tumor cells uh, contained a gene construct which allowed fluorescence. So if you implant the tumors at five days, you get an increase in fluorescent signal, and you can see an increase in signal intensity indicates a growing tumor and increase in tumor size. If you then irradiate with five times two gray, you can see a reduction in growth rate. Subsequently, the tumor regrows. And if you give larger doses, four gray times five, you can see a greater reduction in growth. So they have a tumor model here where they're looking at the response of GBM cells in the origin site. So using this model, they address the question of vascular genesis versus angiogenesis. 
And what they did in some very elegant experiments, they looked at the BLI, which is the fluorescent index to indicate tumor size against days post-treatment. And here we can see in blue, this is a control animals with no treatment. You can see an increase in size with time, as you'd expect for a growing tumor. If they give just ADM3100, which is a compound I'll explain in a minute, they show no difference from control. If they irradiated with five times two gray, they saw a growth delay, but then the same rate of growth once the effect of the radiation has occurred. But if they combined radiation with ADM3100, they saw an immediate decrease in control of tumor and a very long, prolonged effect. So this ADM3100 compound shows a very large effect in combination with radiation in this orthotopic GBM model. ADM3100 is a compound that inhibits hypoxic mediated signaling via SDF1 and CR4 and CR12. So if you add ADM3100, you inhibit hypoxic signaling, and if you inhibit hypoxic signaling, you prevent neovascular genesis, therefore you prevent the formation of new vessels which the tumor needs to regrow. So clearly in this study, a very beneficial effect of preventing that neovascularization which drives tumor recurrence. They did a similar study with control animals again in blue, irradiation this time with a single dose of 15 gray, so it's a nice large tumor growth delay, but again it grows at the same rate eventually. And a secondary compound, a DC 101, they showed a longer growth delay. And a similar concept here, this DC-101 is an inhibitor of the VGF signaling pathway, which is hypoxia-mediated. So if you can inhibit hypoxia-mediated signaling that drives neovascularization, then you can address tumor regrowth and recurrence in glioma. And what they were doing with these two compounds, they were preventing the recruitment of bone marrow-derived cells that were CD11B positive, so therefore derived from the bone marrow, circulating in the blood system, arriving at the tumor, driving the formation of new vessels, which then permitted tumor regrowth. And they showed this quite eloquently in some serious experiments. They took, a mat, they took a, a regular mouse, they bone marrow transplanted it with green fluorescent protein bone marrow. So you can see the recruitment of cells that definitively came from the bone marrow because they're green here against the blue background for normal cell nuclei. And if you irradiate with 8 gray or 15 gray, you can see a greater recruitment of these green fluorescent GFP cells that originated in the bone marrow from this chimeric animal. And in subsequent panels within the manuscript, they show control animals where there's no recruitment of bone marrow derived cells versus irradiated cells. And you can see here in red, these CD11 B cells are recruited. And they even mark which CD11 B positive cells, type 2 cells, and GL1 cells, indicating they were definitively from the bone marrow. So they demonstrated that recurrence in this model following these large single doses or following fractionated treatments was driven by neovascularization reflecting the recruitment of bone marrow cells. So they demonstrated that the biological significance of G, uh, resistance in glioblastoma was due to neovascularization. And this restores radiation-damaged vasculature, allowing the regrowth of tumor cells, and that drives recurrence. And I think this is the most important effect of resistance in glioblastoma. We know that the vascular cells and GBMs are resistant compared to the tumor cells, and also there are tumor stem cell-like cells that are more resistant than a conventional glioblastoma cell. But I think the most important is this neovascularization. And in this nice cartoon that reviews some of this literature, we see here the primary occurrence of GBM with angiogenesis as a major factor driving the growth of blood vessels to feed that tumor to allow tumor growth. But following radiation, we see that angiogenesis is lesser importance and vascular genesis driven by this HIF1, SDF1, CXCR4 signaling pathway, recruiting those bone marrow derived progenitor cells to drive neovascularization to feed this tumor to allow tumor recurrence is more important following radiation therapy. And this may be different after large single doses. But again, more work is needed. So to conclude in this rather busy conclusion slide from the animal models, and we have to remember that these are animal models, and they are subcutaneous, some of them, but the last study was an orthotopic where glioblastoma cells are grown in the brain. 
Radiation in the therapeutic range blocks local angiogenesis, and Steve showed similar things, which requires, therefore, neovascularization for that tumor to survive and continue to grow during treatment or post-treatment. And this is really driven by hypoxia signaling, if one signaling driving upregulation of SDF1, and that's a great hypoxic chemokine. And then that recruits these CD11B positive monocytes from the bone marrow to drive this formation of neovascularization. And the circulating endothelial progenitor cells are also shown to be involved, and they're very similar to these bone marrow-derived cells. So we can see that if you irradiate with large single doses, you're inducing hypoxia. That hypoxia signaling pathway detected, and then signaling pathway drives neovascularization. So to conclude, out of all the data I've shown from the animal studies, the subcutaneous and the orthotopic tumors, I'd have to say that vascular damage is less significant at small dose fractions. But large dose fractions, SRS values of 10 grade, grade fraction, you're getting a large, rapid reduction in blood flow, and it's prolonged, maybe lasting seven days, and that radiation-induced hypoxia then drives the process of neovascularization, which then allows tumor recurrence. And this is predominantly driven by this HIF-1, SDF-1 axis, as we've shown by inhibiting this SDF-1 signaling by ADM-3100 in that orthotopic study, once you inhibit this pathway, you can maintain good tumor control, or I'd say excellent tumor control in a GBM. So neovascularization drives tumor recurrence, and this was clearly established in the GBM models. And there's a different level of signaling following standard conventional treatment versus these large single doses. And I think that's my last slide. Yes, so thank you for your attention. Thank you.